thanks so much for coming uh, into our little ride around Detroit with the uh, the car. We will try to avoid successfully for the 87th time of going to Canada um, <laughs> because it, the, right the road there. really, really wants me to go there. And uh, but I'm I'm avoiding it so far. So so that's been cool. Um, so uh, what I wanted to talk, well, so we were just talking about, you know, how much you drive or, you know, do you have to drive around a lot? Did, did you have kids who played soccer? Uh, so I have three kids and they were involved with lots of different sports and yeah. problem solving groups and robotics and things. So, yeah, so yeah definite yeah, yeah. road warrior, right, definite right. used to be minivan mom and then yep. it was SUV mom. Yeah. Uh, but they're all grown and flown now. So oh, okay. I'm right. just enjoying yeah. road trips. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We actually kind of tricked out the minivan with like a big, like, um, like battery and everything so that, cause I would just, we'd have to go to like all day for like a soccer game or something. And I'd just go there and work all day, yeah. you know, from the back of the minivan, um, right. which is so so much hires. downtime yeah, in between yeah. the kid activities that you certainly can. Right, right. It was, it was, yeah. uh, it was entertaining. Yeah, um, absolutely. But so why don't we talk about, uh, you know, kind of why we're here, which is, um, you know, so you've been working with your team to kind of uh, integrate Kubernetes more as a as an option. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, like, uh, you know, why are yeah, you doing that? Yeah. So I'm responsible for the team at Ford that is really all about developer tools and relations with them. Mm -hmm. Um, so we manage the tools that our devs use, like GitHub and Jenkins and et cetera, et cetera. Big, uh -huh. big 14 different tool tech stack for myself. Yeah, um, yeah. Also, always the way, always the way. <laughs> exactly. But I also have um, teams who curate different platform products, ecosystems, to help accelerate our developers at the broader company, mm -hmm. um, be able to deliver software much more quickly. Um, so uh, one such team is our uh, CAS team, Container as a Service team, uh -huh. um, and they really um, have been doing a lot um, over the last few years in identifying, you know, how to stitch together the various tools and how to educate our developers as we onboard them and as they kind of grow in their maturity right. um, to use all of the benefits you know that containers yeah, and yeah. Uh, bring to the company so do they actually work with the individual development teams about um like kind of bringing up an application over or are they more like providing a, a framework and a set of tools um so that they're more self-directed teams um so it's both, both? actually yeah. so they, they build is. the platforms <laughs> right but then they're also definitely tapped on the shoulder yeah. when there's specific needs uh, and we do individual consulting with product teams as needed. Right, uh, right. So oh, we, cool. we try to extract ourselves from that part right, at right, a certain point right. once we feel like their training wheels are on securely. Well, you um, should definitely talk to the, um, or take a look at Acorn, who I just interviewed, um, because what their mission is to try to make um, Kubernetes like more developer friendly. Um, and so, you know, they kind of have a, a format which kind of feels more like Docker Compose, but is actually Kubernetes, uh, so that it's a little bit more straightforward. Oh, that's awesome! I'll definitely check them out. Yeah, yeah. And so, so what are, you said uh, you had some other teams as well. Yeah, so we have uh, um, other other platform teams that um, you know help uh, curate um, web and mobile apps. Right. Um, so we have those platforms that we stand up and uh, manage. Um, we have uh, responsibilities to help the organization for quality testing right. and for right. load and performance testing. Um, so uh, various teams to just really help the community. Um, one of the things I'm excited about, and, and I just attended the backstage session, oh, yeah. um, is we're using backstage to do exactly what that whole talk was at Cubicon here. Oh, that's always cool. Right, yeah. which is to, cre yeah. to create a, a place where devs can go and they can see what's available all of the tech docs are right there uh, and we're getting ready to uh, ramp that up and roll it out for all of our products and consolidate like if you right. can think of right. all of the different places yeah. how that, many versions of python do we need to be running in exactly production? yes exactly so that's going to be a huge um you know step forward in my team's ability to uh, focus on less uh, which will really be right, more impactful. Right. Yeah, when when I was in consulting, uh, one of the like we kind of had two big offerings that we did, but one of them was you know platform you know portfolio reviews, and you know so we'd go to mon you know big companies like Pfizer like in a division right and, and try to try to do exactly what you're describing, and uh, you know we had the advantage of being a third party right, so we kind of had outsider looking in, but the disadvantage of not knowing where all the secret scary stuff was right. you know underneath desks and things that were actually running production applications. 
uh, yeah, that's a that's a big hurdle. Yeah, that's yeah. the that's the tricky part. In fact, I'm in the middle of an audit right now, um, and you know, I control Jenkins, the people who decide to use what my offering is. Mm -hmm. But anybody can do whatever the heck they want. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and I don't have any control of that. Right. Like I don't have any ability to influence well, that. In and they will. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to stop that, right? right? But I do want to educate them. So we're going to be de deploying like training and, and all these different things to help mitigate that risk, um, which is daunting because, you know, I had planned to target one community and now I'm realizing, <laughs> it's all oh, yeah. I have to actually target the whole enterprise. <laughs> right, right, right. So. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's definitely interesting. The, uh, I mean, you were saying particularly you're concerned about security and yeah. like, um, not so much the security itself as much as making sure that developers are aware of security and the, the security risks that are kind of new and different about yeah. doing something in, you know, kind of Kubernetes. You, what, what's been your experience there? Yeah. So um, I've been really focused mostly, so I got this role in January and my main mm -hmm. focus has been um, education and onboarding and, um, you know, things um, that are available in the marketplace that help us do that are very convenient. The community that you yourself help curate is very helpful for yeah, that, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but what I'm realizing is that learning curve is pretty steep. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one of the keynotes this morning was talking about how just kind of over in the last year, the implication, the security vulnerabilities that have been identified on, um, you know, K Kubernetes instances has been skyrocketing, right, like right. exponential growth. But when you start, when you have a whole bunch of people start using it, that tends to be what happens. Exactly. Right? Right. So how do I now help also change the focus of our education to include that, mm -hmm. um, deepening their appreciation and understanding of security vulnerabilities so that they can, you know, develop more securely so they can know how to mitigate risks when they come up. Right. And then how can I help build visibility into where those vulnerabilities are for the company so I can help burn them down, right? So right, I can right. help um, improve I Identify overall. them and making sure that they, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's developers, uh, you know, it's such a weird little world in the sense that, um, you know, people compare it to engineering, but in a lot of ways, it, I also generally refer to it as, it's much more like writing a book. And you, and because you rewrite, 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 rewrite until it's, it's good. And so what that means though, is that developers have an inordinate amount of impact on what kind of literally gets built, but also like figuratively gets built. And so the more you can tell an engineer about like what, what they're trying to accomplish Accomplish, the better decisions they right. make down in the details, right? right? And I think one of the things that we've definitely had as a gap for a long time, and it's finally starting to get better, is that one of those things should also be security exactly. in that, you know, you, you need to properly understand security as just a regular engineer um, because all those little tiny decisions you make actually often have a pretty strong security yeah. impact. Yeah. And, and it's definitely changing, you know, we're doing a lot more, you know, secure by default kind of, uh, you know, deployments and things like that. So I think it's, it's getting better, right. but I can definitely appreciate yeah. that. That's a, that's a big task. Yeah. yeah. Well, and a lot of the tools are coming along that we can utilize to scan code and right. to, um, right. identify where those are and to bring that visibility. So we know what to tackle, but I think, I think it's like a cultural change impact yeah. also yeah. that you have to um, impart that that one of our priorities is, is security, security right. so right. that it can, you know, that can be part of our DNA and it's not something that's kind of after the fact corrected, for example. Right. It's a, uh, it's, it's funny. Like I always joke about myself that, um, I'm a, you know, I'm a true developer, so I don't care about security. I don't care about like, you know, uptime, any of that stuff. Um, you know, uh, but you know, in fact, what, because I teach it and I've done a lot of production stuff. And in fact, it, it is really important to, you know, testing is ridiculously important. Yeah. You know, security is ridiculously important because the impact, especially when you're doing certain kinds of software, the impact can be, you know, very actually someone's like life, right? Yeah. You know, if you, if you screw up the wrong piece of software yeah. um, and I, it's like, you're, you've got a much bigger, burden on what you're doing, I think, than a lot of engineers realize when they're, you know, typing some Python code, right, you know, right. um, and it's, it's got a lot of impact and nobody wants to be the uh, front page of a newspaper. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And the, and the reality is what our, what we build and the fact that a lot of our um, things are for customers to use, mm -hmm. protecting the sanctity of that relationship with our customers right, right. is super important right. and, and, you know, trying to treat them like family um, and how you would make sure that you're 
taking that care and that uh, focus. Right. Yeah. I mean, coming from Red Hat, right? Like, you know, one of the one of the major strengths of all of our products, right, is the fact that people trust Red Hat. You right. know, and so the last thing you want to do is break any part of that. Um, yeah. And it can be it can be really difficult because, you know, when you're you know at least for me, right, when you're down deep you know, building something, um, it can be difficult to remember the why almost, mm -hmm. um, because you're like, you just want to build it, you know, you just want to get it done because it's cool. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. so do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, KBE, like what, um, you know, what's your experience been with uh, Cube yeah. by example? Yeah. So, um, we have, you know, been using, um, and moving toward our cloud native, um, vision mm -hmm. for many years before KBE was kind of a thing. Yeah. And we've used various training sources to kind of upskill. What I love most about KBE now is it's something that is community kind of curated, mm -hmm. uh, relevant examples, mm -hmm. and now we can use it to point our team to instead of kind of creating our own materials right. Your own version. or, or yeah. looking for whatever software um, training that we've licensed, right, and, and kind of going through and saying what's a relevant example. Right. Um, it's a much easier place to go and find uh, sources to say, here, go read this, right, right here's some examples. Um, and it's really simplified our ability to make that meaningful impact in a quick way. Right. Um, so I will say our adoption continues to grow, uh -huh. uh, and uh, we've appreciated that. And it saves us from being technical writers and deployers of right, education, right, right. right? Well, and I mean, you know, the, the reason, you know, communities are, are good, right, is like, you know, I, I keep talking about this in these interviews, right, is that you also get lots of different perspectives, yeah. right? So, you know, you're not, you know, there is a Ford mindset, right? right? Like, you know there is, right? So having, um, you know, something that's out in public makes it so that um, you can, you know, whether the Ford mindset is a good one or a bad one, it's kind of, doesn't matter. There's always different perspectives. So the more people you can yeah. kind of involve in a conversation about how you're approaching problems and things like that, the better a job you can usually do, yeah. you know? So I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, kind of community delivered stuff. I think one of the things that, I wonder if you experience is like in in my life as you know I'll, I'll get students who want to say who will say you know hey can you give me a list of sources for learning about this thing right and you know do you find that having that you know cue by example right is makes it a lot easier to say oh yeah here it is yeah, yeah. exactly right exactly that's exactly how we use it almost like a reference mm -hmm. right a, a way to um, say oh here you want to learn more here Go right here look right. at this right and point to this um, specifics and it's interesting that at Ford the people who are most kind of community minded I know <laughs> we have geese everywhere in Michigan they're very fun it is fun <laughs> they're very messy though yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the the people who have been attracted to work in a team like mine right mm -hmm. where we're enabling the organization are the ones who care deeply about contributing to their greater community right. and about yeah. helping them about sharing their knowledge and, and experience with others um, that can really impact the whole of the company. So um, it's it's really an honor to work with that community. Um, you know, it, it has been an honor this year and I continue to look for ways that I can help them make their voices heard right. even more and be more impactful. Um, so it's been it's been terrific. Yeah, I think I think we talked about this before. It's like one of the things that's uh, very difficult to do is like, especially for somebody who is kind of known as an enabler of, you know, new technology or whatever, is shifting from that one to one relationship that you often have to, you know, one to a thousand or one to a million. Um, because the the way you have to deliver the content is quite different. Right. Um, and, you know, and until you get some re you know experience with doing it it's, it's really really hard um and you know and making those things accessible you know especially when you talk about you know rolling out tooling making that accessible to your to people who've never been presented it before again it's like you you and whoever it else you know help build it you have your own mindset so you have this like this preconceived notion of how things work and so when you look at it it's all very intuitive but then somebody else looks at it and they're like why does this work this way and and then you're like oh yeah you're coming in from a different view yeah. uh, so it's it's really quite difficult yeah that's been interesting when our when some of our people if they're having difficulties they'll come to our team and ask specific questions like how do yeah. I do this one thing and I encourage my team to ask bigger questions like right. expand it what is the problem you're trying to solve right. Right. Don't assume that that 
if you educate them on answering that one question, it's going to solve their problem because it, right. it's unlikely to. Right. right. This is just the next thing they're investigating, and it might not actually solve the bigger problem. Right. So I always encourage them to ask bigger questions. What yep. are What are you really trying to solve? How can I help you with that? Instead of just kind of responding with. Right. Here's how you do it. Yeah, one of, the, uh, one of the big things I've found kind of in my career is like when somebody asks a question, you really want to think about where did they get this question from? Right. You know, and then, and you know, try to extrapolate from that. And then what do you know about what they're trying to do, right. you know, or ask, right? Um, yeah. and, and make sure they're kind of aligned. You know, doing dev advocacy, that was a big part of it. It's like, have you thought about maybe not fixing that bug and try this other thing over here? Because that might work a lot better for you once right. you understand what the problem they're trying to solve is. Exactly, um, exactly. But yeah, that's a that's also, a, I think it's also uh, particularly kind of goes against the, the typical, you know, software developer's mindset. Right. Um, you know, my default is like, I want to just answer, yeah. you know, um, because I want to get back to whatever I was doing. Exactly, because you know? they're always that kind of context switching and distractions, right? right? right. My team is, con they're, they monitor many different channels because we want to meet our developers where they're at. But as a result, if, if they're also trying to do heads down work and creating the next platform, it's a distraction, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. um, so the, the normal response is a quick answer, but I encourage them to kind of take Explore that deep breath it a little and say, bit. Yeah, yeah. oh, why would someone ask me this right. question, right. right? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I remember like, and I don't know how, like, how accurately I'm remembering the story, but uh, supposedly Microsoft put out a management book for you know, managing software engineers uh, in the like 80s and 90s. Um, and, uh, and one of their guidelines was that every engineer should have a door. Um, because uh, every time somebody asked them a question, there was a 15 minutes that it took them to get back to wherever yes. they were. Um, and that if there was a door there, it could be a door that was like, you know, you're fully free to like come in or whatever, but the, just that physical barrier would make the person who was gonna ask the question think a little bit longer about it yeah. and sometimes solve their own problem rather than pulling the person out. Um, and it's always kind of struck with me as kind of a really interesting, you know, it's, it's totally true, right. but at the same time, you've got to find a way that you can make the people available. Yeah. You know, this is, this is why it really annoys me when, when nobody uses office hours, right. you know, it's like, right. this is the best way I can give you this and still do my stuff. Um, but the problem is the office hours are rarely lined up for when exactly I have a problem. Right. You right? want your question answered in the real yeah, moment right. that it's happening and not necessarily wait for when it's right for the experts. But, right, right. But there's ways, I mean, I encourage my mentees and my team to consider, you know, like you are in charge of your schedule. Mm -hmm. And if you need heads down work, block yourself as unavailable out of office. Right. You know, turn your uh, notification on your instant messaging to do not disturb, mm -hmm. right? Don't answer, shut your outlook down, shut right. your IMs down, right? Um, so that you can do that. Heck, even unplug from the Ford network. Right? Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> right? right. Focus, right. whatever you need to do to focus. Yeah. Um, and make it known, like through whatever, whatever kind of notification that you have at your fingertips to say, you know, I'm, I'm working on this, I'll be available at 12 or 1230 or whatever the, you know, whenever you're kind of coming up for air. Um, and that, that sometimes works, but yeah. usually what that does is it says, oh, He's not available. Let me go to this person, and they right. end up asking the same question around to ten different people, and now oh, you've distracted ten people. Oh, because the expert people. didn't have the answer. Oh, yeah, right? that's true. That's true. And that's yeah. that's kind of a time suck, also. It's right. Like how can we combat that? It's been interesting since we were all virtual. Well, one of the things that I've kind of really missed about, um, you know, like there's a lot of old school internet people, right? Um, and there were a lot of like social norms that were really important. Um, and it's really funny. I, I'd never heard this until a couple of years ago, but they called it, um, they call it now endless September because it used to be in the early days of the internet, um, every September, you got a whole brand new set of users of the internet because they went to college. And so you could train them in all the like social norms. And I even remember yeah. doing this like email training thing that somebody had built, you know, and, and I just kind of signed up for it and I learned about how to use the internet, right? Yeah. And, but one of the things that was huge about IRC, right, the internet relay chat, is that you could 
put you could put whatever you wanted out there as like a question or whatever and there was no expectation that the person on the other end would right. immediately respond right um and what's changed i think because of like text messaging primarily you know is now we have this expectation in things like slack or you know all these other tools that if you're there you will instantly respond right. um and it's really it's really unfortunate i think that we've lost a lot of these you know original kind of norms you know one of my other ones is um you know, email, you always used to reply below the the original one. Right. And the reason was, and I never knew this actually until I went to Red Hat, was um, because that way, if you're just getting to the thread, you can read it in order. Oh, uh, yeah. Instead of having to like try to figure out how yeah. to read it up. Yeah, I always go to the bottom of the message and then read right, up. <laughs> right, right. Um, but if you actually reply on the bottom of the right. message, um, yeah, and it, it's one of the things that really annoys me about Outlook on the web. Yeah. Uh, you can't even do it. Right. Um, yeah, right. I was like, I can't do an inline response at all. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we've kind of, it's funny, I just think it's kind of funny that we're kind of coming somewhat full circle on a bunch of stuff that we knew a long yeah. time ago, you know, but have, have kind of faded out of, uh, you know, the culture, essentially. I, absolutely. I think that's, that's so true. And it's funny because people who are younger than me don't remember but I remember the when I first started at Ford the secretaries would print the executives emails oh yeah because yeah. they didn't know how to check their email and respond right. and then they would they would dictate what the response was and then the secretary would go right. in and respond to the email and I just remember thinking because I had used email in college right at you know, we were, I was the early days of the internet. Right, right. Floor, right? Hey, my school was on BitNet, so yeah, yeah tell me about so it. Yeah. That was so interesting to see that divide, but, but it's right, it's kind of like, it used to be memos, and then it was emails, right. and now it's instant messages, and now with the notifications that you expect likes and smiles, and right. and that right. kind of, you know, adrenaline, or what is it? Um, yeah, I know what you mean. You uh, know, the, 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 uh, serotonin. Serotonin bump. Serotonin yeah. bump, yeah. right? That you are, you're constantly watching these channels to see, did I get a response? Am I, you know, am I getting that kind of right. boost? Um, and it's flipped. It's flipped kind of what we hold as important. And really what it's doing is it's creating way more distraction, way right. more inefficiency and in actually getting solid work done. Um, so that will be, and you know, that will be kind of the next thing of how do we find the balance yeah. really, you know, exactly. it's, it's like everything else, right? We get all these pendulum swings, you know, back and forth and, you know, yeah. periodically, you know, like <laughs> eventually it comes, you know, comes a little bit back. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the things I've, I've seen so many times now in my like, you know, technical career of just, you know, various technologies, you know, swinging all the way to one side and yeah. all the way back to the other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I, and uh, what I what I suspect is right. There's some happy medium in there that you know we haven't discovered yet. Right. You know. Right. Um, but uh, I'm not necessarily saying we should go back to the old way. Just that you right. know there were definitely some advantages. Um, so yeah. So uh, how are you enjoying KubeCon? Uh, so um, it's been pretty good so far. I got here for the keynotes this morning, and I attended two sessions so far, and I'm getting value out of those. So this is my first Cubicon event. Cool. I'm so excited that Detroit is hosting it. Like, yeah. I don't think that the tech world understands what an, what a big technology base we have in Michigan and the kind of um, evolution of the auto manufacturers being based here with all of that kind of foundational core engineering and yeah. manufacturing are, is like turning all into tech skills now. Um, so to be able to showcase my beloved Detroit yeah. um, with the tech conference and invite people from all over the world to it is exciting. Um, and then and then Michigan itself, we're, I'm a board member on the Michigan Council of Women in Technology. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, what we are trying to do is make um, Michigan be the number one uh, place for women in tech. Oh, uh, So cool. we do all different kind of um, programs for uh, K through 12. We uh -huh. do uh, college student mentoring. We have a scholarship program. We have a kind of re-entering your career, maybe up in the tech field. Right. Um, we have, uh, you know, early career development, mid-career and um, executive development. My wife is experiencing that right now. She just took her first job in forever uh, earlier this year. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's been a learning curve. Yeah. It's been really interesting because I'm like, 
no, of course you don't do that. And, you know, because I, I don't realize how right. how much I've had from my 25 years of experience. Yeah, it's you normal. Know? But when you're first right. coming back into right. the workforce like that, there's all those little things you need to learn. Right. And, and how much the social change has yeah. been as well. Um, and so that's cool. So what, um, you know, have you have you launched any programs yet? Or is oh, it, yeah. This yeah. has been an organization that's been around. I think this is our 24th year. Oh, wow. OK. Um, wow. I've been yeah, involved cool. for 10 years, and this is my first year in a leadership position uh -huh. um, for it. Um, I'm just you know certainly I have two daughters and a son and mm -hmm. you know two my all three are going to be engineers oh, really? um, yeah. so I'm just it's a passion that I have to show that this is a, a very lucrative uh, right. and rewarding career path um, that often um, girls are disheartened to pay attention to right um, so I'd love to be part of that um, community to help foster that and grow and develop and I mentor a ton of ton of people whoever asks me because there's so few women in leadership right uh, in you know tech companies and tech positions um, so anytime someone asks me would yeah. you be my mentor absolutely I want to give them a role model to so, show that you can do this like right. persevere through the stumbling that you have as you're kind of learning things and, and so whenever conversations like this come up I, I bring this up a lot but um, there was a, an article in Cosmopolitan Magazine in 1979 about why women should become programmers um, and how it was just like running a dinner party. Um, and I think it's so interesting, right? Because uh, in a lot of ways, it's 100% right on, right? It's like you basically have to give, you know, when you want to be a programmer, it means you give very detailed instructions, right? Yeah. And so you got to think about all the little details, like is, you know, you got to make sure you seat this person next to that person, but not that other person because they don't like each other, right? Or they right. used to date, right? Or something, you know, but then you also have to plan all the recipes and figure out, make sure the timing is right, you know? And, uh, and it was such a great article. And, you know, and the fact that it was in Cosmopolitan Magazine, right yeah. is also particularly interesting um and you know uh, and then what happened right yeah. um so i i definitely agree with you yeah. uh you know i kind of say you know part of the reason i joined uh boston university is to try to make it so that less people who look like me are in my field or there's more people who don't look yeah. like me in my field yeah it's hard um, to be the only one in a room yeah right and that's yeah. been the majority of my career there's you know i, I remember being on a team there was six women and 84 men, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So we created our little women's group so we could talk and things like that. Right. So right. it's it's hard to hard to be in that situation. But Ford's been great. They've been um, a great company to work for, and I've always felt respected and you know that's able cool. able yeah, to that's good. make uh, advancements when I needed to. Yeah, I remember we were at a company. Uh, it was like 30 or 40 people. So not, I mean, not it was big, but it had very very few women. Um, but we had inordinately large bathrooms. Um, and I still, so I became really good friends with one of the women. Um, and she was like, yeah, we all kind of had this collective angry moment where um, we hired such and such. And that meant we didn't all have our individual stalls anymore. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's such a weird experience. You know? so like, funny that yeah. there were so few that yeah. they each had yeah. their own stall. Right. That's interesting. Um, but it, it was an inordinately large bathroom. Yeah. So it was, uh, so it was a little bit better. But yeah, it was, it was not a great ratio. Yeah. Um, yeah. We had the added difficulty of it was also consulting, um, and so you know there tend at least in my experience there tends to be less women in consulting because it's also yeah, yeah insanity. Um, yeah, but. there's a lot of travel involved. I know my husband has been a road warrior for the last few yeah. years. Yeah, and I'm so grateful he was more technical um, when my kids were young and around, so he was home for all of the things. And now that they're grown and flown, he's able to travel and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, my wife actually really appreciated um, when I... Because I used to travel as a consultant. I was mostly a fixer. So it'd be like on Monday, I find out when I was supposed to be on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but I'd only be gone for like maybe two or three days. So in some ways, I didn't travel that much. Like I wasn't like on the road all the time. But what she really liked was I switched to being like more like developer advocacy. I had a well planned and I'd be yeah. gone for like a week or a week and a half. And so they could have a new schedule, right? right? You know, rather than me just kind of, you know, disappearing yeah. and then being back again. Um, yeah. So that was always, uh, that it was a really interesting moment for me. Yeah. Um, you know, on the flip side, she, uh, you know, we often joke that she married a consultant. And so periodically she's like, don't you have like a conference or something to go to? Like, could you go away for a Oh, bit, yeah. You know? I've had so, that conversation, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've had that conversation, too. Like, we need a little time apart. Right, when are right. you traveling again? <laughs> right. My, uh, it's funny, too, because my parents um, 
have spent a significant amount of their time while they've been married uh, like apart because they both work in academia mm -hmm. and so and you know basically you go where the job is right, right? right. Uh, and so you know they were bouncing around a little bit um and yeah i can't believe how much it, it, i feel like it's it in my head right it's like normal because it was my parents right um but then i kind of look at it from like the outside and i'm like oh no that's oh, that that's really, really not normal that's yeah. really unusual yeah that is very unique that yeah it's very unique does anyone want me to turn left again I missed my turn, so uh, I'm I'm now negotiating with the GPS about what to do next. Yeah. So we have uh, orange barrel season, and then we have yeah. winter. Yeah, winter it's funny. Season. In Boston, we call it construction season in winter. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I like the it, uh, one of the other locals with the video crew was saying um, uh, it's the the state flower of Michigan. <laughs> it's, exactly. it's the orange barrel. I was exactly. like, that is awesome. That's so funny. Yeah. That's so funny. But you know, you want to have good roads for, um, you know, we, we don't have mass transit, right? We're the auto, auto. Yeah. You know, Although I did water. drive the people mover. Oh, um, yeah. So that was fun. Yeah. Um, because like when I, uh, when I first saw it, because the, there's just a sign in the hotel that says, you know, people mover this way. And I like asked, asked one of the employees, I was like, so where and what is a people mover? <laughs> and then she goes back to me. She goes, well, it's this thing that moves people. And I'm like, thanks, thanks. I suppose I deserve that. Um, but it was hilarious. Uh, but yeah, but I did finally manage to take yeah. it. Um, it's kind of like the Disney monorail. So you, yeah, you yeah. feel like you're going to the Magic Kingdom and then you get there and you're like, oh, <laughs> what? Where's the castle? <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, my, uh, actually my dad used to work at Disney. Um, and uh, so I've actually been on the Disney monorail a number of times. Oh, wow. Because when uh, my, my dad had to work and my brother and I were, would spend summers with him, um, he would just drop us off at Disney oh, for perfect. like the day. You know, we would just wander around Disney and go Sounds to like, like all the Sounds like a pretty awesome childhood. Yeah, it was pretty cool. <laughs> and it's funny. It's like my, you know, my wife always wants to take our kids to Disney. I'm like, ah, why would we go there? It's so boring. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little jaded. Yeah, you've been there too much. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, but it was pretty cool. That's cool. Um, so uh, we're just about time. You want to kind of wrap it up? and uh... Yeah. So um, I just want to encourage if you're listening today to recognize that um, Ford has a lot to offer uh, for people who want to move in their technical advancements and their skills. We invest in our people and we have a lot of very interesting jobs posted on careers.ford.com. So hint. check it out yeah. and uh, follow me on LinkedIn or connect with me on LinkedIn. I might be able to put you in touch with the people who have the skills that you're interested in. Well, and I, I think it's it's interesting to point out, right? Like Ford, like many other company, uh, you know, manufacturing companies, et cetera, like you're doing a ridiculous amount of software. Um, you know, like, we, you know, I don't think it occurs to people yeah. like how much software that goes into both the creation of a car, right? But then on top of it, actually making this car go, yeah. right? And uh, and in some ways, it's really interesting software because it's it's unusual, right? Right. Um, and so I, I definitely would think it'd be a lot of fun to work on a, like a nav system, you yeah. know? Um, so, well, thanks so much again for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see you again at the panel in a few Yeah, hours. it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.